to Accessible Art History, the podcast, Season 11. As mentioned in the trailer, this season will focus solely on women artists. Too often, they've been relegated to the sidelines of art and history. So, I want to feature them and teach you about how they overcame adversity to change the world around them. All images and sources will be in the associated blog post linked in the description details. Make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for all updates. So, without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to Season 11 of Accessible Art History, the podcast. I'm so excited to start this journey through women and art history. To kick things off, I'm covering St. Hildegard of Bingen. Also known as the Sibyl of the Rhine, Hildegard was a nun, artist, author, and mystic that lived during the High Middle Ages. Please note that though it's highly likely that there were women artists before this period in history, documentation is almost non-existent. That's why we're starting during the medieval period. She lived a fascinating life, and I can't wait to tell you all about it. So to learn more, keep on listening. As with many sources from this period, it's important to take this information with a grain of salt. The majority of what we know about St. Hildegard comes from a biography written by two contemporary monks, Godfried and Theodoric. Born around 1098, St. Hildegard's parents were Mechthild of Merksland Nott and Hildebert of Bernheim. They were minor nobles in the service of Count Menhard of Spoonheim. Some records indicate that she was the youngest of seven, while others state she was the youngest of ten children total. With medieval records being spotty and the death of infants and young children often not recorded, either number is likely. When she was eight years old, St. Hildegard was given to the church and placed in the care of the Benedictine monk named Juta. She was a recluse who, like her sisters, spent the majority of her time in meditation and isolation. In 1136, Juta died, and St. Hildegard was elected as mother superior of her community. Soon after this election, she had a vision that instructed her to move her community to Rupertsburg and live in even deeper poverty. This caused a shakeup with church leadership, but St. Hildegard was stubborn, and she eventually got her way. Although she wasn't formally educated, St. Hildegard became an authority within the medieval church. Not only did she correspond with local bishops and abbots, but she even wrote letters to the Pope. This was incredibly rare in the medieval era and speaks to how highly she was regarded. According to her writings, St. Hildegard began having visions when she was around three years old, but she didn't fully comprehend what was happening until she was five. She called it, quote, the shade of the living light, and it was a gift that she couldn't explain to others, even to her fellow nuns. The visions consumed all five of her senses. St. Hildegard finally told the world about her visions when she was in her 40s. Previously, the only person that had known about them was Yuta. She started discussing them with her fellow nuns because the visions started making her physically ill. This description of them came from her first work, Scavius, which I'll discuss in a bit. Quote, but I, though I saw and heard these things, refused to write for a long time, though doubt and bad opinion and the diversity of human words, not with stubbornness, but in the exercise of humility, until I lay low by the scourge of God, I fell upon a bed of sickness then, compelled at last by many illnesses and by the witness of a certain noble maiden of good conduct, another nun, and of that of a man whom I had secretly sought and found, as mentioned above, I set my hand to writing. While I was doing it, I sensed, as I mentioned before, the deep profoundness of spiritual exposition, and raising myself from the illness by the strength I received, I brought this work to a close. End quote. When she began telling people about her visions, the news made its way to Pope Eugenius. He then instructed her, and also allowed her, to document them as messages from God and the Holy Spirit. This gave St. Hildegard instant credibility that led to her writing multiple volumes of work. This is why we have such good documentations of her life and art. Next, we're going to discuss more about St. Hildegard's life and her writings. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring accessible art history, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part, it's absolutely free to use. 
As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Now that we're back, let's dive into St. Hildegard's writings. Over her lifetime, she wrote three volumes of theological work. The most famous one is the first volume I talked about, titled Scivius. In addition to writing the material, she also provided the illuminations. Written around 1151 to 52, this book explores 26 of St. Hildegard's visions. They are divided into three sections by theme, and that was done to represent the Holy Trinity. The sections are about the creation and fall of man, Jesus, the church, and the sacraments, and then the kingdom of God. She wrote this book as a guide to salvation in the style of Old Testament prophets. Scivius was not St. Hildegard's only writing. She also wrote two other volumes on her visions, Liber Vitae Martorum, which was written between 1158 and 63, and this detailed her views on morality, virtue, and vices. Liber Divornium was written after 1163 and described a vision akin to St. John the Evangelist at the beginning of his gospel. It was about God's relationship with his creations. St. Hildegard also wrote 69 musical compositions to help explain her visions. In addition to this, she wrote medical texts examining how various herbs and tinctures could help with illness and injury. This was not necessarily divinely inspired, but more from practical experience gained from living in a religious community. She did, however, connect it with the book of Genesis, saying that God put everything on earth to help people. Finally, St. Hildegard also created her own language and alphabet. It only consisted of nouns, about a thousand of them. Called the lingua ignata and the literae ignatae, she used them in a way that we use crossword puzzles today. Although she had been venerated and respected for centuries, St. Hildegard was made a saint and a doctor of the church in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI. She is one of only four women doctors of the church. The others are Saints Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avella, and Therese of Linsois. The Pope spoke about her dedication to her community, the recording of her visions, and her humility when he canonized her. He stated, Let us always invoke the Holy Spirit so that he may inspire in the church holy and courageous women like St. Hildegard, who, developing the gifts they had received from God, make their own special and valuable contribution to the spiritual development of our communities and of the church in our time. End quote. Her feast day is September 17th. Being made a doctor of the church is a big deal. Especially during her lifetime, women were rarely allowed to participate in church activities outside of the nunnery. However, St. Hildegard went far beyond the walls of her community, writing to and speaking with important figures like popes such as Eugene III and Anastasius IV, statesmen like Abbé Juget, the French abbot who is known for his development of the Gothic style, rulers like Frederick I Barbarossa, Holy Roman Emperor, and other notable figures such as St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Last season, I covered The Dinner Party by Judy Chicago. I've linked the full episode in the show notes. One of the place settings in this work is for St. Hildegard. For the section of her piece, Chicago took inspiration from Gothic cathedrals. There are also artistic details representing St. Hildegard's art and visions and how they contributed to Catholic teachings. It's a beautiful homage to a remarkable woman. St. Hildegard of Bengen was able to rise above the constrictions imposed on her gender to earn respect and fame. She also set the stage for other women to do so. Although it happened fairly slowly, her life still set a precedent. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the life and works of Manners painter Lavinia Fontana. Thank you for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. New episodes will premiere each Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review. Make sure you follow Accessible Art History on Instagram at accessible.art.history for all updates and daily art of the day posts. See you next time!